Hey guys, what's going on? <laughs> you rounder here, and today I've got a um, data point hand history analysis video for you guys. So I went ahead and kind of got started on this um, today because I want to work out a, a good format. And I actually kind of like the format I got. I kind of got the idea from another member of the uh, Coaching for Profit group where he was taking, um, <clears throat> we kind of shared our notes on all the videos and stuff that we had been given. And um, I saw one person had done a lot of where they'd like take a screenshot of what was happening and then talk through like their notes. And I was like, that's a pretty good way to like do it. Instead of trying to like type out everything that's happening, you just take a quick screenshot of the hand that is being discussed or, or, or whatnot, <clears throat> or the grid or whatever it is, if it's a grid and PO solver. Anyway, instead of what I did here, which is like just wrote sort of what the hand was with no way of, right, like 10, five of clubs, calling turn, bet, imposition, light, and then kind of going through it. This is sort of a one-off, unless I go back and find this 10, five of club hand, which I didn't put any information with it that would give me a way to find it. I know it's marked. It's actually like marked as a, you know, um, data point hand history review hand, but uh, you know, I don't know if I'm going to go back through those too much realistically. However, this I can kind of go through and review some of the hands I made and I'm so like this one, see how you can see it's highlighted red. That means that I think I made a mistake here. Now there's a couple options. I could submit this hand um, and send it to my coach and ask him or if I'm like pretty confident about the fact that it's a mistake then I can kind of just use it as something to review. I can compare these data points right here, which are all sort of things I found that are sort of, excuse me, information that I have that tells me whether or not something's correct. Now you guys probably can't see this. Let me just show you real quick with the hand so that, um, so all I have here is the situation that I think is the decision point. And then right below it, I put the line. So the line is the button raised called and the big blind raised, meaning it's a three bet pot. And I think, I think I've decided to put, um, to clean it up a little bit. So this should, I mean, hopefully pretty much as long as I understand what's happening here, uh, it should be good. But um, if I submit a hand, what I want to be able to do is pretty much just copy and paste this all and then put it in the forum and be done. Um, so that'll make my submission process really simple because I can review, you know, 10, 15, 25 hands, pick the five most confusing ones and then submit those for review. Uh, so in this hand, pretty much it went, um, I three bet from the big blind, which no problem. I C bet the flop, no problem. I barreled the turn. Don't love the turn barrel. Um, there is a data point here that I highlighted that's a turn. Uh, well, one, the turn should be overfolded. And then in three bet pots, this is a thing I picked up. I don't know exactly what hand this was in reference to, but I got a note here that says in three bet pots, be careful double barreling medium cards that connect well with opponent uh, range. Opponent range. And don't generate additional fold equity versus pairs. Meaning this eight on the turn is a medium card. It probably improves our opponent's calling range since we don't have top pair, right? Like one of the hands that opponent can be calling with is top pair. So it sort of improves his range more than ours. Um, maybe, I mean, I'm not sure range versus range, but we're the three better, he's the caller in position. He is going to have a little bit more like medium strength hands. We're going to be um, a little bit more polarized towards uh, like, you know, high cards and, and air. Um, like we're gonna have like king four suited, queen four suited, all that stuff. And you know, he's not going to have those things, but he's gonna have like seven, eight, eight, nine. Um, actually, I don't even remember what he had here. Oh, he had uh, nine, nine jack. So he hit the straight on the river. Anyway, point is, is this turn should be overfolded. And so once that turn is overfolded, we can add more strength to the opponent's range. Um, and therefore, once he's like betting on the uh, river, you know, then there's some other things come into play. So one, we want to be careful barreling this turn. 
Um, although I don't, I don't hate it. It's just, it's just a note that like we do want to be careful. We also were barreling equity, so I think it makes it a little better. Um, we need to be super sensitive to the full range and the full line uh, that took place in the hand. I'm not sure that this wasn't done, but it could be an issue, right? Because the fact that this line is, you know, we went bet bet, you know, and you know, the fact is this player called twice on a low board uh, that's fairly connected. Um, so pot size bets are weighted heavily towards value. Like, so we know that pot size bets are like very heavily weighted towards value hands. And then um, this is sort of the same thing. Like this is a kind of, I think I can probably combine these two in my notes that the taller the bet size compared to the pot, the stronger the villain range. Um, and, and this sounds like, oh, well, that's obvious, but it's like, it's disproportionately true. Um, yeah, it's like disproportionately true. And then players don't thin value bet enough, right? So we don't expect this player to show up here with, well, ace 10. So essentially there's a com combination of things like, Players don't thin value bet enough, and and do I dominate any of his value betting range? Like those two are kind of combined. So like I, I think I could clean this up a little bit in in both my 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 notes that I'm drawing these data points from and in the actual data points. But we'll get better as we go. Uh, so we don't expect him to be turning a thin value bet into a bluff. We don't think he's thin value betting enough, and that kind of ties into do I dominate any of his value betting range? Right, like. Is he doing this with a7? Is he doing this with 10, 6? Like, right? like it's hard to find, you know, there, are, there is no value hand that he does this with. So right there we say, okay, he's not bluffing enough, right? So he's way under bluffing and none of his value hands are beat by us. So if those two things are true, it makes for a very easy fold, which obviously is not what I did or this hand wouldn't be here. Um, anyway, so this I thought was like a massive mistake. Like just a, this is a train wreck of a hand. Um, it, it's when I filtered for my hands at 25 NL since I started playing 25 NL, this was like the biggest losing hand. I mean, we were over, over 200 big blinds deep. Um, right, yeah, we're, yeah, 200, 200 BBs deep. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, uh, this I think that um, the play up until the river is okay. Again, the turn call could be suspect, but realistically, this is an eighty-one big blind call mistake on the river. Right? This is a this is eighty-one big blinds. So like that's like a buy-in that is just a. I mean, we just lose like you know ninety-nine to one hundred percent of the time, maybe even one hundred percent of the time, we lose this eighty-one big blind. So that's huge, right? I, I like that's. I've played, uh, hold on. I played somewhere in the ballpark of since since starting uh, 25 no limit, somewhere around not quite 5,000 hands because I think I've played for five days now at 25 no limit and I think I got just under 5,000 hands so not quite 1,000 hands a day that I've played. So, you know, real quick, just, just to give you an idea, right? Um, 5,000 by 100, right? Easy math. So that's 50 EB per, per 100. Um, so this one hand is worth 0.6 BBs per 100 on my win rate on all 25 no limit that I've played this year. So folding here ups my win rate by almost one BB per 100 over my entire sample of hands. One mistake. Um, over 5,000 hands is a, a 1 BB per 100, which maybe that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's massive, right? That's like, that's that changes your, you know, hourly rate significantly, 1 BB per 100 does. And that's just over this sample, you know, this, um, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, anyway, I don't want to go crazy. All right, next hand I reviewed is a little bit more interesting in the sense that I wasn't, uh, this was a, this was a cooler. Um, this one, oops, no, we haven't gotten to that yet. So 
Um, again, here I put in my my line. This might be hard for you guys to see if you're if you're watching the video, but pretty much um, button to bet and then folded the small blind uh, raised and then called and the big blind raised. Meaning, it, it's kind of I don't know what the best way to write out the line is. I think this makes sense. The button raised folded, the small blind raised called, and the big blind raised, meaning four bet. So that looks like this. It's a little bit weird to see in that format, but I, I think it makes sense. And then the line is um, check call, check, check, bet call. So check, um, call, check, check, and then bet. Uh, so here um, I said correct play, I'm not sure. I Looking at this hand, I can't really, it's a little bit of an awkward line. Um, check, call, check, check, bet, call, or bet in general it is a little strange. So I thought that, uh, one, I thought the king, queen offsuit, like folding to the four bet is probably okay. I think calling is probably okay too. I think that's relatively close um, against an unknown. We don't really have any stats on this guy. Uh, the other thing I thought is if we check river, we are facing bet check bet line, which is under bluffed. And in a four bet pop, we don't expect to beat any, uh, maybe many is the right, um, the right word. We don't expect to beat many of his value bets. And then I put except maybe ace king and ace ace, but don't those bet the turn. So what I'm saying here is I don't, I, I kind of looked through my notes and I couldn't find anything very, one, it's a four bet pot, so it happens like very rare, right? Like four bet pots are just less frequent, so it's a more uncomfortable situation. And then, um, you know, because it's a like more uncomfortable situation, it's just going to be a little bit uh, more, you know, tricky to play. The other thing is if you can't, you know, fold, jamming's better. So I think the jam is the right bet size. Question is if I check and he, bets right maybe he bets like half pot that makes it a little easier if he bets all in which is probably more likely now i'm facing a bet check bet which again i said is under bluffed but um you know couldn't he do that with aces would aces value bet i don't know what aces check back um you know realistically there is only one straight possible on this board it's 10 jack so he would have had to four bet 10 jack uh so that's that's a factor if he had a set of kings or a set of queens, he would have had to check those back on the on the turn. Ten jack also would have had to check back on the turn. So he would have had to like really slow down with all of those value hands on the turn, which is certainly possible. But this is a hand that I'll submit because I'm a little bit lost as to what's happening here. And I don't know if it's a big mistake. I don't know if it's sort of indifferent. It's just something that I don't really have the confidence to answer. So I think this is a, a good hand to, um, to submit. What I'll do is I'll just highlight that red, highlight um, So this is going to be a submission hand. It's not yet posted. And what I can do is after I submit it, I can come back and add in something after that's sort of a, a, an answer. So this, I think, will be a pretty good review tool for me. Um, I like using the images of the, the spot. I really think that sort of focusing in on one, one decision point and most likely the river, right, that's where we've decided the biggest the biggest uh, win rate changes come. I mean, like one hand affecting your win rate by one BB per hundred over 5,000 hands, you know, that's that's where your win rate goes, <laughs> you know, comes and goes. So let's move on to the next one. Um, looks like we've got a 10 queen. I have not looked at these yet. I looked at the first couple, um, but now we're on to hand number three. So let's, let's sort of see what happens. Um, so we're just gonna kind of go fine, fine, fine. This should be a check. What is this? We flop a straight. Um, this should be a check call. We would never raise this board. Okay, I kind of like check calling better here. Um, okay. Now we should bet. 
that's fine. Call and I mean, we've got 50 BBs left. Uh, I think we want to bet here because if we check, we allow our opponent to play perfectly, right? Like they can take their two pair, ace jack, ace king, um, and they can uh, check behind those hands and then they can just bet with their flushes and, and full houses. So I think I like betting. Yeah, I bet. And he ends up having uh, hit the flush on the river. So, I, I mean, right, this, this seems like a cooler. I don't think this is worth thinking too much about. I mean, yes, a lot of stuff got there on the river. Like now all sets beat us and all flush draws beat us. And those are big parts of his range. So yeah, I mean, I think it's cooler, but like, can we really find a check call here? I mean, I would say that's the worst card in the deck. Maybe like a 10 of clubs would be worse or something, right? Like, like a 10 or queen of clubs, I guess would be worse potentially. But I mean, that would just make a more split equity. I don't know. I don't know if I want to spend a ton of time on this hand. Um... Yeah, kind of like calling the flop. Maybe, maybe we would check raise jam the turn again. I don't, I don't think any of that matters too much. Um, yeah, I, I just, I mean, if we check and he jams here, like, do we expect ace king or king jack or ace jack to bet? Can we kind of go into our rules like? I almost I almost get the impression during a lot of hands that checking on the river is a good idea for me sometimes because like when out of position because I can theoretically like fold you know strong hands because I can sort of evaluate the river well or at least that's the idea is I'm supposed to be able to get really good at evaluating the river and being able to determine that you know these these things these things apply across sort of the database that players aren't value betting thin enough and that that I could potentially make a fold here you know make like some sort of huge fold in a spot where maybe like there is less chance right so like another thing to think about and this is sort of this is why reviewing hands is good because I, I don't I can't think about this stuff in game at this point but when we bet here Ace King, Ace Jack, King Jack, those seem like hands that are more likely to raise. Any set should raise here. So on the river, I think we take a lot of sets out of his, uh, you know, a, if we give him, you know, say, whatever, however many sets, three, six, nine, um, you know, nine sets potentially, right? Like we would think that like half or more would, would raise here. Uh, we would think... Maybe, you know, one or two of them, three bets the flop, uh, another three or four of them <clears throat> raise the turn. And so on the river, out of the nine possible sets that he had on the flop, maybe he only has like one or two of those left. Of the two pair he had on the flop, maybe he only has one or two of those left. And then on the river, what do we end up with? We end up with very few full houses, um, maybe some split equity with queen 10, and a bunch of flushes, right? Because that's kind of the rest of his range because a lot of the other hands would have already raised. Uh, and then, you know, if we check here and he jams, we're sort of deciding, well, what does he jam a straight here? Which I don't know, right? I mean, like, I'm not saying we could fold here, but Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, now that I think about it, like if, if we do, if we run it that way and that line of thinking, he gets here with, yeah, I would think that most straights would also raise this turn. Right, he, he, he only has, uh, what, 
16 minus 4. Oh, what does he have, like 15? <laughs> I mean, he has to have called with queen 10 off. So if we assume he only calls with queen 10 suited, which is probably fair, then he's only got two combos of that. And, you know, maybe one of those raises on the turn. Uh, or just jams the flop, right? So, like, there's not that many queen tens in his range. So, really, on the river, he just ends up with a couple two pair, maybe a full house occasionally, and then flushes. And against that range, maybe we can fold. Now, I don't have time to do all this in game, but it is worth kind of running through this scenario. So, maybe this hand's a little bit more interesting than I at first suspected. Uh, and then, like, we would kind of weigh, you know, he gets there with flushes. He can probably find a fold with some of his two pair that we don't get value from um, because of the run out. I don't know. This is actually kind of getting more interesting. I may actually post this hand um, now that I dig into it a little bit more. Maybe we can find a fold. And and the thing is, is I can post it and not have the results, and then you know wouldn't be as results oriented. But I think that this logic kind of follows. I don't know if it's a little bit too assumptive uh, or not. Uh, anyway, let's um, let's move on to another one that's, I'd like to find one that's like a clear cut mistake. I'm gonna save this for this hand and let's go to the river and I will snapshot this picture. And then I'll kind of come back and do it later since we've already um, kind of talked through it. Um, how do I do this? Okay. So I may actually submit that one. All right. Looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Looks good looks like a good spot to fold top two right um i guess the only question is you know does he do this with like jack nine or jack six which both should be in his range. Whoa. He's got like a little bit lightheaded. Um, I was like standing straight up. So he flat called in the big blind, which should be just a very wide range. Um, so jack six suited, jack nine suited, jack nine definitely in his range, jack six suited probably. Um, so we don't want to go into combo land too hard. But the point is, is on this river, right? Like he, he um, so a couple things can be happening. He can be barreling draws, which um, like what got there on the turn, obviously 10 king, right? That's a perfectly reasonable um, hand. I don't, I mean, are a lot of players raising 10 king of diamonds here? 10 king of spades, 10 king of hearts? I am maybe, I mean, yeah, there's some pretty good equity there. I would, but like, again, we don't, not every player is playing like me. So, yeah, I mean, some some draws are going to raise here. Queen 10 is, you know, definitely likely. Um, so, you know, Queen 10 gets top pair here. Um, the other things that are obviously in his range are sixes and nines. Um, yeah, I mean, some sort of seven, eight, like, you know, seven, eight, heart, spade, diamond. Um, so the diamond comes in on the turn. He bets big again. Uh, you know, there's some other stuff we can say here, um, which is as far as data points, right? That like, you know, large bets are more skewed toward value. Uh, I don't think folding here is um, necessary. And then... The diamonds come in on the river and you know we know over bets are skewed towards value i think like i'm looking at this guy and he looks a little a little bit crazy and we've got top two pair but i don't know how many again it's hard not to be a little bit results oriented because i know that he didn't show up here with jack six or the hand wouldn't have made it through the filter so if he you know i 
it's hard for me to say whether or not Jack six and Jack nine do this because I know in this particular circumstance, that's not what he has. I'd have to go and find some, you know, other plural file like this where a guy did this to, to really know. But I do know that um, so 10 king and 810. 810's a big part of his range. I didn't think about that one. So 810 had an open-ended straight, then hit a straight, and um, now the, the flush, the backdoor flush came through, which most people aren't going to be too worried about. So like, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think 10-8 is a big part of his range since that an open-ended straight is something people raise a lot. Uh, and then maybe some backdoor diamonds. So is he ever value betting worse, right? We have sets, we have 10-8, we have a few backdoor diamonds that might get there. Um, and then we have like this idea that Maybe sometimes a, I mean, I, like a one pair hand obviously doesn't do this. So it would really have to be like Jack nine, Queen Jack, or something else. So we have to like pretty much get a lot of air into his range and think that he behaves pretty irrational with worse two pair hands. Um, to to find a call here and to make it correct, right? Like, I think we all should see this. Uh, so I'll kind of go in and, and try to pull some data points uh, for this hand, because I think this is a mistake to call. I assume we call here. Um, I, yeah, I think calling here is a, a pretty good mistake, even though it's blind versus big blind. And even though we hit top two, these are the hands that I think are a little bit interesting if we can kind of identify our player pool tendencies. These are like the big folds. Again, you know, 73 big blinds. We don't have to do the math again, but that's another half a big blind. So now, you know, we've, in the first four hands we've reviewed, which are the largest, we found, you know, a big blind and a half per hundred of win rate, uh, you know, in the first, you know, four hands and, uh, and maybe more. So let me pause this. I'm going to fill some stuff out and then we'll move on. All right, so I got I got a little distracted. I actually posted something in um, in my uh, coaching for profit group because uh, I remember at one point in a video I was watching, uh, my coach Nick had said that he feels like he could be just shown screenshots of river bets and you know get nine out of ten of them right as to whether or not to fold. Uh, just looking at like for example what you're seeing on the screen right now like a screenshot of the final board with the betting action on the river and I kind of just sent him a message because I was curious if um, I think I think what he means is that the most relevant data point is on the river so one thing I want to start doing um, with this to increase its value is ranking the the data points in order of of importance. So almost always on a river decision, the number one data point should be the most relevant information on the river. So for example, like there's a data point that says players are not bluffing the river enough. Well, there's also a data point that says over bets on the river are massively weighted towards value. So while these are both even river reads, the most important data point is the one that's one like most relevant happening the most recent so the most recent thing happening right now in this pot is a river bet not only that but it is an over bet which we have specific information about so again trying to sort of drill down into what i should be thinking about in game facing this 73 big blind 74 big blind bet the number one data point is river over bets are massively under bluffed or massively weighted towards value. Now, I don't have data for like what massively is, but you get the idea. That's number one. I mean, included in that bigger, you know, in that circle, there's another little data point that says rivers are, you know, um, not bluffed enough. And then if overbet is massively weighted towards value, the next relevant question is, do I dominate any of his value betting range? Well. I mean, the overbet is also like 
weighted towards nutted hands. So if it's if it's massively undervalued and, and sort of massively weighted toward nutted hands, do we dominate any close to nutted hands? And the answer is obviously no. So I think like this is an example where if I showed you know my coach a screenshot, he would look at it, he would look at the board texture and probably say he doesn't really care what the action was up until this point on the river, it's a fold. That's what I'm guessing. And that's what I asked him in the uh, on the board. So we'll see if he comes back with an answer at some point today. He's a pretty busy guy, so um, if not, then that's okay. Uh, sorry, I spelled massively wrong. Uh, so I think those are really the most important data points, and I think that we can stop the decision at that point, right? Like I think that's enough right there to make our decision. And then, um, you know, if we wanted to wind it back a little bit, right? The only other real key decision or, or key data point I would say is that he is making a very tall turn bet. So we could go back to the turn and say, um, and tall is sort of this free. I hadn't really heard this before, but it works. And it is, let me see here, it's over here. So taller, the bet size compared to pot, the stronger the range. I will show you guys this hand. I know I've been not showing, I, I looked at it just a minute ago and I was surprised, but it doesn't matter, right? We found the fold. We know that this is a correct fold on the river. So we have this, if we wanted to add one more thing, we could say that uh, this, and I'll just take out, um, I mean, I guess it applies to the, to the river in this case as well, since it is a very tall river bet, but we've kind of already did, let's not, um, uh, so I'm gonna read, the guy that wrote, I'm copying this from one of the other students' notes, and he is not, um, yeah, English is his second language, I believe. So the taller the bet size compared to the pot, the stronger, villains range okay now i know these videos aren't as exciting i don't know did the screen change color for you guys i'm assuming the recording software picks that up it, it just changed i have um flux and uh it changes the takes the blue out of the um screen as it gets late i actually could probably turn that off or set it to like different times since i'm staying up so late i probably don't need the monitor like making me more tired um, if I'm going to be staying up late playing. Anywho, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll show you guys what he had. Um, he had the 10 deuce of diamonds. So he, he did play his draw very aggressively, um, but again, if we just looked at the river screenshot, we'd have all the information we needed to make the fold. Also, another thing that is I, I mention a lot is, you know, what what happens on certain cards to the number of bluffs the opponent can have, right? If we say, like, we know that, yes, sometimes, like, the diamonds are going to be part of his barreling range occasionally. So when a diamond hits on the river, it, it does take away diamond draws that he had. So we could also say that on a three of hearts river, um it becomes a much closer play because he now doesn't have any barrel diamonds. Now, I don't know if that still makes it a fold. I don't know if this player still jams the, makes this bet on the river, right? Those are things with, that we would have to get really assumptive about to know if, if a player is doing that enough. But I think what you'd be surprised is that I think, totally in assumption land here, a lot of players would just check fold when they missed, <laughs> like, right? I, like, I think a lot of players would actually just give up um, if, if they missed here. But um, yeah, on a three of hearts, yeah, I think he probably just gives up a fair amount. Uh, and if not, then, you know, we still are now looking at a sort of different board texture that doesn't have a flush possible. 
All right, anyway, I think we beat that one to death. So that's hand number four. We didn't even do any, like these take a while when I'm doing the video. I mean, they take a while anyway, but all right. Nines. Um, I mean, yeah, nines are probably pretty close to the bottom of my calling range. I'm wondering how this goes down. This looks fine. Yeah, okay. Moving on. Uh, yeah, versus button. I could pull up my my ranges, but this is probably okay. Oh, I think I remember this hand. Oh, I seem to remember this being, what when was this? 11.04 p.m. on the 22nd. This is a couple days ago. All right. Raise is fine, right? We call, we check raise this flop. This is a good flop to check raise. So right away, I actually um, think there's some data that's relevant. This is a good turn. This is a question I like, a legitimate question I have to ask because I think there's some um, some conflicting ideas in my head about about the, the a turn a low turn card and double barreling and single raise versus three bet and if you check raise the flop and if you don't check raise the flop so i think that i've got like some ideas that are a little bit tangled and this is a good hand to illustrate that so like right now let's kind of just talk a little bit Right now, the data point, the main, the most important thing right now on the flop is that he just called a raise. We know that the check raise is overfolded. So he just improved the strength of his hand like massively. We'll use that word again. He very much improved the strength of his hand. Now, here's the problem. We get a very good barreling turn card that if he does have over cards that he called with backdoor backdoor draws which the reason that the the mono to, the rainbow board is so good is because players don't defend their backdoor draws enough so we don't think he has that many backdoor like flush draws he probably doesn't have that many just naked over cards that he's calling with although he should and then the six is you know a couple things like now if he did call with like ace two ace four suited um a pair of sevens although those are less likely a pair of fives something like that mixed feelings on like the fives tens nines all that is probably still not going anywhere but um you know the idea is that if he did float if he did call with like some some backdoor draws whatever now the low card is essentially a brick problem here is that if he did call with like fives um sixes sevens uh, threes whatever now he's got like a bunch of combo draws if he had like seven eight um right like a lot of his calling range is sort of actually connecting with this card a little bit more than maybe normally i don't know if that's true or if that's just nonsense that i'm that i'm saying it's hard to tell sometimes <laughs> and then uh the other thing is how it interacts with our range which we don't we kind of think about secondary because we're playing so exploitatively that we're really focused on what's going on with his range more um but then you know i just turned a gut shot so I turn some equity. So I'm guessing I, I barrel here. And right, so I barrel here and he calls. Now we have two really like strong data points that say this guy has a hand. One, he called a flop raise. Two, he called a turn barrel on a card that again should be overfolded were it not for he already had a very strong range. So probably a bad turn barrel maybe not because of the gut shot I, I don't know this is a spot i'm really unsure about um now we get a jack which i don't think does anything for anything and i'm sure i fire here and get snapped off by a pair of kings so yeah not really who what actually what happened here hold on did i miss something so he whoa, 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 whoa. okay so yeah this is a single raised pot Oh, yeah, and I, okay, single raise pot, and I check raise, and that's, yeah, that's good. Yeah, so, 
I could almost get on board with it. I don't know about the turn barrel. It's probably just a check. I, I could I could see a world in which it's okay because I turned equity and because it should be overfolded, but I still think it's probably a check. So I think we are probably pissing away 20 big blinds and then maybe another 50. So maybe another 70 big blinds. You know, it's almost another BB per 100. Um, so we found, you know, what, almost three BBs per 100, you know, theoretically. Again, this is great. This is plus EV. Um, no problems here. This is, I don't know, I'll call it maybe 10 BBs because it's not like, yeah, I definitely have a question about the turn and I think the river is just spew. This is just 50 big blinds of spew, right? Like should never be folding. There's no, look at it. There's no draws. I mean, like there's nothing, not only that, but like when we take this line, we should have two pair plus. And we should be getting value from kings. Like that's the worst part is like, this is such a strongly played line by us that like we can do this with value hands and get called by kings. And I'm not, I mean, I don't know. Like I'm probably having a tough time with kings here a little bit, right? Like it's a big blind caller. Like I, I have all this junk in my range. So like I have tons of hands in my range that are hitting two pair sets. And what straights are there? Five seven. I mean, five seven's in my range. I have every five seven suited in my range. If I don't three bet it, I guess I three bet most of them. But he doesn't know that. Anyway. Uh, yeah. So like, there's a couple like interesting parts of this hand. One, we should have some pretty good value when we do this. We have all sets, right? We three bet eights, I think, but we have fours, twos, sixes. You know, all all, all this stuff should be good reasons for us to get a lot of value here from Kings and not be uh, bluffing our stack off. Yeah, realistically, from this point on, we should only bet with our, our value region. So I think I know the answer to that, but I do want to get clarification on the turn. So what I'll do is grab this part and put in what I think is relevant and then add in at the end um, like a, a question that I have about this. All right, so what I tried to do is summarize this. I made this a horrible color you probably can't read. Um, tried to summarize uh, this spot right here on the turn. Um, I said the, the line is, you know, um, Button raise, big blind calls. We go check raise, and then bet turn. He calls bet river. We call. I guess that none of that matters. I guess we just care about the bet on the turn. So I said, uh, you know, when we check, when we check raise flop. I don't know why I wrote check raise weird. When we check raise flop, we get to the turn with stronger villain range. But the turn is also considered a good barrel card, and in this case, gives us equity. How should these two data points be weighted? Right, I think that's a fair question. Um, I think the answer is going to be just check and hope that you get a free look at the turn and otherwise check fold. Uh, again, it's just it's hard for me to not be results oriented because I'm still learning this stuff. So like my my opinion is almost just helplessly weighted towards thinking that whatever happened is more likely, whereas somebody who's just been doing a lot of coaching and seen a lot of hands is going to be much less biased and, and be able to look at this situation, one, not knowing what the villain has, and then two, um, being able, even if he did know, he'd probably be able to weigh it uh, pretty, pretty reasonably. So really good, um, some good hands, like some just some <laughs> back of lack of better terms, some, some real dog shit play by me in a couple spots and then a couple um, confusing spots and I think some some good learning here on on just the importance of the most relevant data point uh, and we're at 44 minutes so let's try to get through one more hand all right here we go wait I think I think I already reviewed this hand with my group yeah this is I know what happens here so this is uh, this is bad. So yeah, 
Um, this is a bluff that probably doesn't need to get made. I did. I talked to my group about it a little bit. Uh, I can't even think about this hand anymore. This just looks so bad. I, at the time, I said, you know, oh, you know, if he doesn't have an eight, he has to fold here. He ended up having king ten, um, which is unfortunate. You know, we kind of all agreed like we would be folding there um, in in this spot, but we can't give a villain you know we can't give our opponents credit for being able to lay down um big hands so i'm going to skip this one for now uh but let's just kind of really quickly go through and see what like the data point is that you know how how should this have gone so this is fine this is fine well yeah we check um he bets half pot um, check raising on king nine seven is fine. It's just a it's a dry board. We we have a seven, but that is sort of uh, we are sort of doing this for protection. Again, what you know what's the most important data point here? I think what we're seeing is a little bit of a pattern in that. Uh, let's pull up my. I don't know where this, I don't even have this data point written down. It's one that I know, but I don't think I've got it written anywhere. So I'll summarize it. Let me see if the other guy has it here. Uh, people stab too wide on broken boards. Small check rise is rather value, not enough bluffs. Players overfold, low disconnected rainbow boards. We can attack hard, check raise, etc. Okay, so that's sort of it. So let's copy that and steal that and add that to our stuff. Base and match. I know you guys can't see this, but I'm. That's why I read it out loud. So the data point that um that he has here is that the flop players overfold, low disconnected rainbow boards. We can attack. I've got a whole set of notes on boards to check raise and that whole strategy. Um, I think a relevant data point to add is that on the flop, um, it's implied in that they overfold, but uh, after um, check raise is called, Opponent's range is heavily weighted towards value. And I'm going to highlight that because that is, I think, like a mistake I'm just repetitively making. That's probably one of my bigger leaks right now is that I will raise the flop, get called, and then another low card will come. It's, it's literally the same card as the other hand, right? Like, like it's a six. You know, like this is king nine seven, which is pretty dry and disconnected for the most part. This is the eight four, same thing, rainbow. Um, this one's lower, so it's actually a better check raise than the king nine seven. But then we get the six on the turn, which is sort of a low blank card. And I'm, I'm making the exact same mistake here and and barreling. Uh, and I, we don't pick up any equity on this one. Um, and I raise the flop, and as suspected, we get called. We get this like really code red river, which. I think I correctly assess that like our opponent probably isn't on a draw at this point. He probably has like a value hand, um, like a top pair type hand, and I think I can bluff him off of it. So anyway, I'm gonna, I wish I could highlight something red. If anybody knows how to change the highlight color in Evernote, let me know. I can change the text color. I can make that red and bold. There we go. That makes it look like I'm really, really struggling with that point. Okay. So that actually is a pretty good board to review and because we're kind of picking up on a, a small pattern. Let's try to get one more hand in. <sighs> if you guys don't like this, if this is not interesting, that's a good sign. Um, this is what I think it genuinely takes to get good at poker. So the fact that it's not all that fun and exciting 
is is very good for people who want to get seriously good at poker and you know <laughs> take a small time out here i was talking to my buddy today and he was um you know i get pestered a lot about <laughs> you know like um you know what i'm doing and you know if i'm looking for jobs etc and right now i'm i'm really legitimately trying to make poker work full time i've got um a little bit of uh, a little bit of money left and i'm trying to use pretty much as much time as i can as much of that as i can to survive long enough to get good enough at poker to be sustainable now may if you followed my channel like i've done this in the past i've done it you know for periods of time but even if you look at those periods of time even if you go and look at like usually it's about a week a week and a half maybe two weeks of consistent work if that and I either get burned out or discouraged by losses. And when I submitted my video to Nick, one of the, the requirements for the application was the, you know, a video talking about like your struggle, what you've learned from it, and you know, what you're going to do going forward. You know, what I talked about was that um, I realized that I'm not good at doing this stuff alone. Like I can do it on, you know, even, even like I use the YouTube channel in a way to keep myself, you know, honest to an extent, but you know, that's, that's mostly one way. That's mostly me to you guys. And so I said, like, what I really think I learned is that I can't do it alone. You know, I need a group of serious poker players to be, um, you know, help one, hold me accountable and, um, you know, be there to like bounce ideas off to study with and to, keep a regular schedule and like one of the things that i've been doing in the group is trying to say like hey like let's let's find some things that we can have going on our own you know we've got the stuff that that nick assigns us um which is like a lot of what i'm doing right now which is also like how important is that like it's not just like oh i want to go through and review hands every day for me it's like this guy's giving me an opportunity to um you know he's he's coaching me and this is the whole, you know, like, this is what I like. Like, I like just being assigned homework, right? Like, hey, do this, run through five hands, send those to me twice a week. Boom. Um, that kind of accountability, that kind of, like, repetition, and someone saying, hey, here's what you do. You need to do X, Y, and Z. Like, that's what I need. I think that's one of the keys to me being successful. So trying to get things like that with the group going also where we um, – I did a video where I kind of just – I cut out some of my my hands that I thought I played poorly from YouTube videos or videos you guys saw. I just took some of them and cut out a few hands that I thought my thought process was like all all fucked up on, and um, you know put them out to the group to be like, hey, he, you know, here's some spots where my my thought process was all messed up, and and I got some feedback on it. And I said, is this something that we think would be helpful if we did? you know, once a week uploaded them and then commented on each other's videos, like just a five minute video of like two or three hands, um, something to get like a regular pattern going, regular work going, the, the repetition. So anyway, um, while what brought this up was, you know, I was having this conversation with my friend. He's like, yeah, man, but you've been, you've been trying to make poker work for months now and, and it just hasn't happened. And it's like, that's true. But, and like, yes, there are like bursts of, focus but like when i looked at my hands you know i could only find like maybe fifty thousand hands that i played last year i mean if i was really serious about poker i'd be putting in fifty thousand hands a month um which is you know or at least like 30 or 40 i mean i should have you know from a year if i'm really serious about playing and i'm playing regularly you know i should have at least 100 200 000 hands like that shouldn't be that hard um, a lot of people watching this video probably have, you know, 200,000 hands from 2016. I didn't. Um, so, like, that's another factor, you know. So, since the new year, I've almost put in 10,000. I didn't start playing until about halfway through the month. But, you know, now I'm at the point where I'm trying to, every day that I play, and I'm trying to play six, six to seven days a week. Uh, like I told you guys, I'm taking tonight off. I'm going to go do some social stuff tonight. But, um you know, putting in a thousand hands a day. Uh, last night I put in more than a thousand. It was probably a massive mistake. 
uh, the, the last video that came out will probably be the ending video from that session, which was a just a completely foreseeable event that I could have avoided. I think at one point in the video, I was like, I should probably stop playing because it's not going well. But these tables look so soft that I feel like it's plus EV and I really should play. Well, it was also like the tail end of like a five or six hour session or something. So, you know, there's things I need to work on with my mental game. There's things that, that you know, that might be a mistake that from now on I can, um, you know, set a stopwatch and say like, all right, I'm starting to play. Um, you know, I've got four hours, right? Like I've got four hours, I, you know, if I want to, I can stop early, but yeah, I've got four hours and, and that's my limit is, um, you know, four or five hours to, to do the session, right? At 200 and... Yeah, you know, figure 200 hands an hour, um, maybe five hours is my limit. I can only go five hours, not any more than that. Uh, something like that. And that, you know, ensures that I get my thousand hands or maybe I only go to a thousand hands. Anyway, point is, is that this is the type of work and I've been doing it for not quite a week. So even right now, like it feels like, all right, I'm putting all this work in, I'm doing, you know, good work. And like literally after a week, I feel like I'm playing better. I, I, I had a session last night where at one point I was up eight buy-ins. And I talked about this during the session. Like I quit poker years ago for like, you know, I couldn't play anymore because I lost seven buy-ins in a week when I moved up to 100 NL the first time. Last night I was up eight buy-ins in one session and, you know, then played too long and gave six of them back. And obviously I was pissed about that. But still up to buy-ins, <laughs> still a winning session. So, you know, the point is, is that like, yeah, I've been trying to do this a lot. I think I've been going in a lot of wrong directions and, you know, this feels like a good direction. So I'm going to keep going into this direction and focus on the process and try to let the results take care of themselves. And that's always been, you know, a goal, but it's always been very hard to do, especially when you feel pressured because of time restraints. So, I don't know, a little bit of a digression. I'm gonna keep going, I'm gonna try to do one more hand. But again, like this type of work over and over again, combined with, you know, playing a thousand hands a day is not something that I've been doing for four months, right? Like. Yeah, I've been playing some hands. Um, yeah, I've been doing some work. I don't know if all the work is all that productive. Now I've got somebody who's got um, a pretty good track record of moving students up and having really good success on the site I'm playing and giving me a pretty like clear-cut system for um, improving and moving up. So it's a little bit easier than trying to go out on my own and figure it out and do it. It's, uh, yeah, it, it feels pretty good. So anyway, hope that's not too, uh, you know, touchy feely for you guys, but oh, well, my channel. All right, this is fine. Um, this is like a standard third C bet. Uh, once called on a monotone flop, I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen this rule anywhere, but I'm guessing that monotone flops are overfolded. I don't have a, I haven't figured out in hand to note exactly how to filter for uh, stuff like that. But uh, I would guess one that's going to come out in Nick's night vision pack uh, when, when it does come out, which I'll probably be getting. And then two, it just makes sense, right? It's hard to defend on a monotone flop because you don't have very many backdoor flush draws or flush draws. All right, so we turn a gut shot. He checks. I'm guessing we barrel here. I'm not sure I like that. I, I kind of like just checking back and realizing we don't have much equity, but you know, again, if the flop is overfolded, it's an ace high flop, so it's probably overfolded anyway because it's ace high, and then monotone probably adds to that. And then uh, you know, we just can't expect to get a whole lot more folds on the turn. And oh. <laughs> so what do you guys think? Think we could screenshot this? 
I could show it to you and you could decide if this is a call or not. And, and like realize how in game, you know, I, I, now I remember this hand, but in game, I'm looking at this and, and it's going through my head that this is certainly a fold, right? Like look at the board. Uh, yeah, I, I get it. I have, I have a straight, um, which means I, I block some of his straights, right? Like that's the only other possible hand he could be doing this with. And when we're either splitting equity or crushed, you know, the, it's, it's a fold. So I don't love, let's see here. I would say that we could pretty much give up um, here. I would say no more money needs to go in, right? Like I, I honestly think that, I mean, and that's what we said when we reviewed it. I was like, all right, well, the, the, the flop is probably overfolded. We could probably just check back and realize our equity. Now, let's say we check back here, okay? So it's a 13 BB pot. All right, we get there, all right? Um, now we just check back the river. So what's he gonna do? It's a 13 big blind pot. He's gonna bet. How much is he going to bet? Up to 13 big blinds, maybe a little bit more. Maybe he goes for a check raise on the river. You know, if he goes for a check raise, yeah, we're gonna bet 10 probably. And if he min raises, then he min raises it to 20. You know, worst case scenario, now we're losing an additional 20 big blinds instead of um, nine and uh, 30, what, 33 and well, well, nine, so 62, right? So we lose 20 big blinds instead of 62 big blinds. So there's a 40 big blind swing. I get it, the, the, the math I'm doing on the big blinds is not particularly accurate, but it is kind of useful to think about, right? If we play that line, if we look at the hand and kind of play it how we think is correct, worst case, right, is we probably lose, you know, 20 big blinds. Best case is, you know, we only lose another 10. Um, you know, if he bets, if he leads river, which is kind of likely, right? Because he, like, we check back, so now it looks like we have a reasonable value hand, so he may just want to bet and, and try to get value from our aces. So he bets 10, 12, 13, we kind of are forced to call, and we lose, you know, 13 instead of 60. Um, again, there's another 50 big blinds, that's another half BB win rate, you know, we're almost up to like, what, three and a half big blinds per hundred of, of win rate that we found in, in a few hands. So. Um, yeah, I think there are other mistakes on this board, like this bet, and I mean, might might be a smooth check back here too, but I think, I think we're kind of assuming he doesn't have the flush based on the way he's played it, and then, uh, yeah, you know, we can save ourselves 24 big blinds here by folding because do we beat any of his value range? There's just no way that, you know, ace queen is raising this river. And if it is, like, okay, but we have absolutely, that's way too assumptive to think that two pair or a set would raise this river. Um, there's no other straights. Uh, we blocked the other ones. So we just have to sort of be like, all right, well, I guess this guy slow play to flush and fold. I think. All right, well, um, I'm going to put some notes on this hand. I don't know if it's a, a, a hand worth submitting because I don't think I have too many questions on it, but I want to note down that I am, this is another, this is sort of the same idea of me not, not, uh, respecting the data point that a certain thing is overfolded. Um, so one, I need to confirm that the, the monotone board is overfolded. And then two, if I confirm that, I, you know, then I need to confirm that like, again, the, the gut shot equity doesn't outweigh 
how strong our opponent's hand is uh, on the turn. So that's like the same idea. So now that's it's kind of three different times that the same same thought process has led me into trouble. Uh, so if three out of the six biggest hands I've lost since I started playing you know, like this year, um, using this system are, are from that data point sort of mismatch, then it's something I definitely need to get straightened out. Uh, all right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you didn't, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I don't, you know, this is uh, part mostly for me. And if you guys enjoy this kind of work, then, uh, then great. Otherwise, uh, no worries. Um, yep, I will uh, see you guys next time. I'm going to probably try to do more of this work uh, tomorrow, and then I'll, I'll do another session late tomorrow night, and we will try to clean up and integrate all this stuff tonight, tomorrow morning, maybe go for a walk, and then tomorrow night, hopefully, some of it's been integrated and we'll be able to actually attack the tables with uh, some of these um, ideas a little more solidified a little bit more concrete, make sure that we don't play a session that's too long, make sure that we stay focused the whole time, and um, get our thousand hands, let the results take care of themselves. Hope you guys enjoyed this. This is you, Rounder. Till next time, keep on grinding, keep on studying, uh, keep on having fun with poker.